Hi, my name is Jennifer Maloney. I'm one of the medical directors at Regeneron, and I'm here to speak about eosinophilic esophagitis and dupilumab as a potential new therapeutic. Eosinophilic esophagitis is characterized biologically by esophageal inflammatory infiltrates, including eosinophils, T cells, mast cells, and basophils, as well as type 2 associated inflammatory chemokines and cytokines such as eotaxin-3, interleukin-4, 5, and 13. Chronic esophageal inflammation leads to remodeling, stricture formation, and fibrosis with the associated worsening of clinical symptoms such as dysphagia. Eosinophilic esophagitis is a chronic disease. The symptoms are related to dysfunction of the esophagus, and histologically, it's characterized by eosinophilic inflammation. Symptoms vary by age, Dysphagia becomes a more predominant hallmark symptom of disease by adolescence. Treatment approaches include removal of foods from the diet, proton pump inhibitors, and swallowed steroids. There are currently no FDA-approved treatments for eosinophilic esophagitis. This cartoon shows a conceptual model of EOE progression from an inflammatory background to a mixed inflammatory fibrotic picture and ultimately to fibrostenotic disease. The risk of developing a fibrostenotic phenotype and the risk for stricture formation increases as the disease is left untreated. There are several gross anatomic features that characterize this disease, and they're listed here, the edema, rings, exudates, furrows, and strictures, and this is known by the acronym of EREFs. This slide demonstrates the progressive changes that occur over time with respect to these features, and ultimately, the fibrostenotic characteristics of disease, which will develop if left untreated, the rings and the strictures. On a histologic level, the diagnosis is made by demonstrating at least 15 eosinophils per high power field in the esophageal epithelium. However, there are many other histologic features that characterize eosinophilic esophagitis as listed on this slide, and you can see some of these features on the microscopic image such as the basal zone hyperplasia, which is represented by the vertical bar. You can see the eosinophil inflammation as represented by the arrows. You can also notice the dilated intracellular spaces, as well as the lamina propria fibrosis, which you can see with the um, asterisks on the slide. Clearly, this is a disease with a high unmet medical need. Last year, the FDA released draft guidance regarding the development of drugs for the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis, and I've highlighted a few points from this guidance on this slide. Firstly, trials should be capturing both improvement in the histologic inflammation as well as improvement in the signs and symptoms of disease. So it's important to both have the symptomatic as well as the objective measures having improvement. Additionally, it's important that the trials demonstrate durability of effect, and for medications that are meant to be administered chronically, a total treatment period of at least 52 weeks of duration is suggested. So if we move in to discuss a little bit about dupilumab, dupilumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody directed against the IL-4 alpha component of the type 2 receptor and it inhibits signaling of both IL-4 and IL-13. The efficacy of dupilumab in several settings of allergic, atopic type 2 diseases have been shown. We have also noted as a result of these trials the importance of IL-4 and IL-13 as key initiators of type 2 inflammation. Dupilumab has shown efficacy in pediatric and adult patients with atopic dermatitis, Efficacy has also been demonstrated in the setting of asthma, as well as chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps. Additionally, dupilumab has demonstrated both histologic and clinical efficacy in a phase two trial in adults with eosinophilic esophagitis, and I'll go into that more in the next few slides. This was a multi-center trial in adult patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. Patients were randomized either to receive dupilumab or placebo. These were adult patients who were non-responsive to PPIs, and they were diagnosed in accordance with consensus guidelines. Active esophageal inflammation was evident at screening with peak eosinophil counts of greater than or equal to 15 eosinophils per high power field, as indicated on esophageal biopsies from at least two of three 
esophageal sites from the endoscopy. It was required that patients have at least two episodes of dysphagia per week for four weeks prior to screening. And also, the Strawman dysphagia instrument was utilized, and at both screening and baseline, patients were required to have a score of at least five out of a total score of nine in this patient reported outcome. All patients also were required to have at least one other type two comorbid atopic disease. The primary efficacy endpoint for this trial was the Strawman dysphagia index PRO for dysphagia with respect to a change of baseline from baseline to week 10. Other secondary endpoints included were histologic measures of type 2 inflammation, also the EREF scores, so looking anatomically at those different changes in the esophagus. Additionally, distensibility measures were obtained and additional PROs were also evaluated. At week 10, dupilumab significantly improved the SDI PRO from baseline. Also, this improvement was actually noted from week 1 following the initial treatment with dupilumab. So there was an early onset with respect to symptomatic improvement following the administration of medication. Esophageal intraepithelial eosinophil counts relative to baseline were decreased at week 12 in all patients. Relative to placebo, the mean reduction from baseline to week 12 in peak esophageal intraepithelial eosinophil count was 86.8 eosinophils per high power field. This was actually a reduction by of 92.9% in patients receiving dupilumab treatment. And the count actually increased by 14.2% in those patients receiving placebo. There was also a marked improvement in esophageal distensibility plateau. So essentially, for those patients who on dupilumab, there was a note that the esophagus actually became less hardened and was more easily distensible compared to those patients who were on the placebo treatment. This slide shows both the dysphagia improvement as appreciated by the SDI PRO as well as the histologic improvement. For dupilumab at week 12, you can appreciate less basal zone hyperplasia if you look at the box on the lower far right. There's also a reduction in the intracellular spaces as well as a marked reduction in the number of eosinophils. And you can make this comparison from baseline to week 12. Note that the dupilumab patients are the patients in the bottom two um, panels, and the placebo-treated patients are the top two um, histologic panels. This graph actually shows the individual trial patients. And you can see each patient is represented by one of the bars. The patient numbers are represented on the x-axis, and the percent change in peak eosinophils at week 12 is represented on the y-axis. And what you can see is that all the patients who were treated with dupilumab had a marked reduction in esophageal eosinophils, with the majority of patients achieving the less than 15 or the less than six eosinophils per high power field threshold. This slide reveals the transcriptome data, and it's actually quite remarkable. Each patient is demonstrated along, again, along the x-axis, and the various genes known to be important with respect to eosinophilic esophagitis are demonstrated essentially along the y-axis. On the right, you can see the healthy controls as well as historical eosinophil esophagitis patients. By week 12, the dupilumab patients have had a reversal of the eosinophilic esophagitis molecular signature. You can see that from a molecular standpoint, they essentially mirror those patients who are noted to be the healthy controls. Lastly, from this trial, I think it's important to mention improvements anatomically with respect to the EREF scores. Overall, there is an improvement in these gross anatomic features over only a 12-week treatment period. And we notice the most notable improvements 
with respect to the exudates and the furrows, which these are the more inflammatory components of the EREFs rather than the stenotic components of the EREFs. So we see more pronounced improvement in those features over this time course. Of course, it will be interesting as we evaluate longer treatment courses to determine whether some of the more fixed features of rings and strictures also have more marked improvement. Safety populations were defined as any patient who had at least one dose of study medication. And you can see here that the majority of patients in this trial did experience at least one adverse event, although this is not uncommon for such an extended treatment period. However, there were no adverse events that indicated any particular safety signal or differed from the overall dipilumab safety database with respect to our other indications. Overall, the medication was very well tolerated within this population. Now I'd like to just provide a brief overview of initial data that we have from our ongoing phase three dipilumab study in eosinophilic esophagitis. This trial is still ongoing. The trial includes three parts. A part A, where patients with eosinophilic esophagitis were randomized either to 300 milligrams of dipilumab every week or placebo. And this dosing regimen is similar to what was evaluated in our proof of concept trial that I just reviewed. Part B is actually ongoing. And in part B, both the 300 milligram every week dose is being evaluated as well as 300 milligrams every other week compared to placebo. The every other week regimen is typical for our other indications and there's no reason really to expect that eosinophilic esophagitis would respond differently to dipilumab. Therefore, we thought it was important to evaluate this regimen as well as the regimen that we know is effective compared to placebo in Part B of this trial. Lastly, Part C of the trial is essentially an extended active treatment period where all patients receive active study medication. Study results from part A of our trial became available this past May, and the data that I'm able to share at this presentation were made publicly available in the form of a press release shortly after those results became available. Similar to our proof of concept trial, patients were required to have regular symptoms related to their eosinophilic esophagitis to be included in this trial. Additionally, they were required to have at least 15 eosinophils per high power field in at least two of the three esophageal regions that were evaluated. Also, these patients were all PPI non-responsive patients. So they had had a trial of PPIs, high dose PPIs, either previously and had an endoscopy within two weeks of that trial, or if they'd never had a trial of high dose PPIs, that occurred actually during the screening period of this present trial. This schematic just breaks down the different parts of the trial. You can see part A, which is what we'll talk about today, and then part B, which is ongoing, evaluating the two different dose regimens versus placebo, and then all patients roll over into part C, which is an active therapy extension part portion of the trial. And as you can see for this trial, we utilized a co-primary endpoint in line with the FDA draft guidance. The DSQ, the dysphagia symptom questionnaire, is a validated questionnaire looking at dysphagia, and patients record their symptoms in a diary daily. So we have information from each day that the patient is in the trial about their experiences with respect to their dysphagia. The other co-primary endpoint is the proportion of patients meeting the histologic threshold of less than 60 eosinophils per high power field. In addition, other histologic as well as anatomic endpoints were evaluated, and we also evaluated as, as part of the other secondary endpoints, the transcriptome endpoints, similar to the data that I showed you from the phase two proof of concept trial. So this slide shows you the dysphagia symptom questionnaire, and you can see here that essentially the score is calculated using questions number two and number three. The goal is to determine if there's any difficulty in swallowing, and then if there was difficulty in swallowing, what interventions were utilized to help the person swallow. You can see that the scores eventually 
are calculated based on questions two and three. When evaluating this questionnaire, you essentially look at 14 day blocks of time. So that's why the maximum score for any two week period is an 84. For part A of this study, 81 patients were randomized. We included both adolescents and adults, so patients 12 years and older. We enrolled approximately 25% adolescent patients. About three quarters of the patients did have a history of topical steroid use. About 85% of the patients had at least one other atopic comorbidity. And the DSQ baseline score was approximately 34 out of that total of 84. And such a score indicates a significant degree of symptoms for these patients. So we enroll this very symptomatic eosinophilic esophagitis population. You can see from the initial data that's available from this trial that we had highly significant results with respect to histology as well as symptoms. And additionally, there was quite a marked anatomic improvement with a 40% reduction in the EREF scores for those patients treated on dupilumab. And this is after a 24 week treatment period. From a safety standpoint, dupilumab, again, is very well characterized from over 8,000 patients treated in other clinical trials. This trial did not reveal any new safety considerations. Given the length of the trial, the majority of patients did experience at least one treatment emergent adverse event, but this is not unexpected again for a trial of this duration. This is actually the last data slide that I can share at this time, but I hope that all together you can appreciate that dupilumab is a promising new therapeutic for this group of patients with a high unmet medical need. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate your interest in this topic um, and I'm happy to address any questions that you may have. Thank you so much.